Good afternoon. I'm pleased to call this meeting to order. This will be the first policy meeting for our two newly elected council members. Congratulations and welcome. We are excited to have you join us. We begin the policy meetings of the Phoenix City Council by giving council members an opportunity to provide updates to the public and to the council, as well as to request information. Do any council members? Councilwoman Williams. Mayor, <clears throat> I too want to congratulate our two new members. Uh, welcome. You will find this an interesting and um, educational process. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Uh, this last Saturday, I want to thank everyone who came to the Agave Library. It was our 10th anniversary. It was very nice. Uh, City Manager Ed Zucker was there. I will tell you, it is a phenomenal place. It looks exactly like it did 10 years ago when we cut the ribbon. Uh, this Friday, June 14th, from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. is the Itty Bitty Beach Party at Deer Valley Pool. Uh, it's a Hawaiian theme for kids six and under, and it's a lot of fun, uh, games, contests, and refreshments, so please come and enjoy that. Then on Saturday, June 22nd, if you come to Deer Valley Park, <clears throat> bring a blanket, enjoy the fun, and it is the most spectacular fireworks uh, display in the city. It's our 4th of July uh, effort and entertainment, and it is great, great fun. District 1's community breakfast will be June 28th. It's at the Metro Center Doubletree. Uh, we're going to have Auditor Ross Tate come and tell what a city auditor does and how he protects the residents and the departments in the city. And then June 29th, uh, there's a shred-a-thon at District 1. We're going to start early to beat the heat at 7.30, go to 9.30. So any documents that you have that you need to get rid of, but you need them protected, this is a great place to bring them. They're shredded, and um, they are always locked in secure bins and destroyed. So please take advantage of these events. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just one announcement, but I think it's a pretty important announcement. On June 26th at the North Mountain Visitor Center at 8 a.m. in the morning, we're having a community coffee chat, and our guest of honor is our mayor. So hopefully we'll have a nice turnout. Looking forward to joining you. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening, today, uh, Grand Canal Scape kickoff. Uh, it's at the Phoenix Coding Academy, 4445 North Central Avenue. That's between the Sevens, uh, Sevens Place and the Health Connections. Uh, with the community discussion re regarding immediate spaces of opportunity, arts and murals, and uh, mile markers and emerging and low-term ideas. And then we have the Family Movie Night free at Solano Park. Uh, Saturday, June 15th, uh, from 6.30 to 9.15. Uh, Lilo and Stitch will be there. I mean, won't be there, we'll be showing it. Uh, and then at 6.30, we'll just have fun events, uh, drum and rhythm circle, which the kids enjoy. And then you can meet your park ranger and community action officer. And uh, there's going to be a kids obstacle course. And free popcorn. So bring your chairs, bring your blankets, bring your snacks and drinks. Uh, it is hosted by IRC, the City of Phoenix, uh, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, and Phoenix Plays. I, last week, was uh, taken back by a new low, and I received this flyer regarding my father. And in this flyer, it just said um, many things that weren't true. And uh, the woman that presented it said that uh, God had spoken to her and needed to deliver a message. And I, at the time, was kind of taken back and assumed that the message was supposed to be delivered to me. But I chose not to take the message because I didn't feel like God was speaking to me. I felt at that moment that the devil was speaking to me. So I opted to get up and walk out. And then the conversation stopped. 
Uh, I find that a new political low. And I want to thank all of those that were present that sent their regards and said that they were very sorry that I had to face that. Uh, my response uh, to the community and to the people is that I have strong spiritual faith. I also know my father's work, and it will stand for the test of time. I also know that when you're brought up in a political family the way I was brought up, that people feel the need to come out and uh, have their own insecurities and, and throw them at you. So as a young woman, as a young child, I had to learn very quickly to be able to survive in a political world that would talk about my parents, in particular, my father. And so I think because of that strength and the courage that I was uh, taught, I was able to withstand what happened last week and uh, with the grace of God and my beliefs and the prayers that were given to me, I was able to get up and walk out. So I'd like to thank my colleagues for looking out for me and uh, sending your well wishes to me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. From my perspective as well, it was a new low last week to use the death of a loved one to try to score political points is deeply inappropriate and you handled it with grace. I, am, I think we all appreciate your father's commitment and the work he did and the fact that, that that would be used in that way was in the context of a campaign was, was deeply inappropriate and we just wanna thank you for how well you handled it. I hope it will never happen again. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Tomorrow we have a community meeting at um, University Park. It's to talk about the um, proposed um, expansion of the Human Service Campus. Um, right now we have about 400 bids and the proposed um, plan is to have about 1,200 bids. So if you want to have some input and let us know how you feel about that, it's tomorrow at 6 o'clock, University Park, which is right here on 13th Avenue and Van Buren. Also this Saturday, from about 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock, we're at the AG building, AE building. That's the building right downtown at the ASU campus. Uh, we're going to have our last meeting about the downtown transportation plan and update um, to the public. So we invite everyone to come out, learn about the study, share your thoughts and how we can improve the transportation in our downtown area. Also, um, it was great to see so many um, students in the Cesar Chavez Leadership Institute this last weekend. Um, they spent the week at ASU. Um, they visit the state capitol. Um, some of the nonprofits, and it's just a great leadership program that for 60 delegates that they have. And this program has been going on since 1995. And I just want to congratulate all those candidates that um, participate in that. And also, as a parent, it's summertime. We're always looking for fun things for our kids to do. And you can turn to our library. Our library has all kinds of great programs, especially for young families. And um, there's a program right now where it's summer reading, where you actually get points and prizes and they make it all, it's a lot of fun. So it starts now until August 1st. So if you're a parent out there and you're wondering what can I do with my children, bring them down to our Phoenix Library and the libraries and we have that summer um, reading program that's great to participate in. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any additional council member updates? Council member Garcia. I just want to thank everybody for the inauguration, all the work from the staff, and it was a great day. And also to the constituents, uh, letting you know to be a little patient. We have an amazing staff that just came on this week. It's our second day uh, in the office, and, and we'll be sure to tend to all those issues that, that people need us to, and again, committed to having an open door. Councilwoman. I also want to thank all the staff, everyone that made the inauguration happen. It meant a lot, a lot to us, all the help that we got, all the support that we got for the integration. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And as well, just be a little patient with us. And we're getting our office up and going and trying to make sure that we attend to all the issues um, with everyone in all of our constituents. 
And also, we, I wanted to make an announcement. One of the things that we talked to people about when we were out in the field and knocking on those doors was that we were going to be accessible and being able to meet with all of the neighborhood leaders and everyone in the district to talk about what are some of the issues that they definitely want us to work on. And we're going to be doing a tour of the district um, on the 22nd of this month, um, and we're working out the details to have um, Mayor Gallego join us um, for the for the tour, and we've also gotten confirmation. Representative Raquel Teran from LB30 will be joining us as well, and we will be going out there um, asking asking our constituents what are the things that they that they want to work on. We'll start in the morning out in in the east side of the district, out in Royal Palms. Then from there, we'll go out to Villa de Paz. And then we'll end with, a, with an ending celebration out in, in, out in Maryville. Um, and we're hoping that we'll have people join us. And we're hoping to be able to answer the issues that people want us to really um, work on moving forward. And second thing is that on, on that same day, I mean, we've seen everything that's been happening um, in our pools and all of the people that have had a lot of issues um, with children's in our pools. And I know that Verano Sano is a water safety event. And it's also happening on the 22nd at Maryville Pool at 4444 North 51st Avenue. And it's, and it's gonna happen from four to seven. It's in partnership with SRP, with free water safety event providers, information about swimming, lessons, use of life jackets, and CPR for all that attend. Free prize drawings will be held during this event as well. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to that very much. Vice Mayor Waring is with us by phone. Vice Mayor, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yes, can I make an announcement? Please. Thank you. Uh, so on uh, Thursday night, this coming Thursday night, June 13th, at 6 p.m. at the Paradise Valley Community Center. Uh, we're gonna have Ed Zerker out at 6 p.m. Uh, to speak a little bit and then answer uh, constituent questions. So again, it's this Thursday, June 13th, 6 p.m., Paradise Valley Community Center, Ed Zerker. And with it, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And speaking of Ed Zerker, our city manager, at this point in the meeting, there's an opportunity for the city manager to give any updates, including on the budget. Thank you, Mayor. Just one briefly is to note that next Wednesday, June 19th, is the third and final series of council votes on the 2019-2020 budget. So that will be uh, released in the packet uh, this Thursday evening and will be on your agenda next Wednesday, June 19th. It is the budget that has been in process since the beginning of March, and we're looking forward to bringing that to a final vote with you next week. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. We will now move to agenda item one, which is an update on the Sky Harbor International Airport comprehensive asset management plan. One of our big economic engines, the big economic engine for the city of Phoenix. And I will turn it over to our assistant city manager, Deanna Janovich, to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. We're pleased to be here today to present to you our comprehensive asset management plan for Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. Joining me at the table today is Jim Bennett, our Aviation Director, as well as Jordan Felds, our Deputy Aviation Director, and Jim will start the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deanna. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Mayor and the Council for the opportunity to present uh, our Comprehensive Asset Management Plan uh, recommendation for Sky Harbor International Airport. Uh, as we begin the presentation, I would uh, also just like to recognize the members of the Phoenix Aviation Advisory Board, the industry and uh, community stakeholders, and all of the public members that have been uh, very uh, helpful to us in shaping this uh, camp, as we refer to it, that we will be presenting today. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, Mayor, Sky Harbor is the largest economic engine in the state of Arizona. So each year, Sky Harbor is responsible for about $38.7 billion of economic activity in the state of Arizona. 18.3 billion of that is a direct economic impact. And Sky Harbor is also an integral part of the Arizona tourism industry, 
with air travelers to the state spending over $5.8 billion per year. And Sky, Harbor Cent and Sky Harbor Airport, including Sky Harbor Center, supports over 58,000 direct jobs. Sky Harbor is the 41st busiest airport in the world, and it's the 13th busiest airport in the United States. But Sky Harbor is not only a self-sustaining business enterprise, but it also contributes to local, state, and federal tax revenues. Each year, businesses at Sky Harbor and the economic activity they generate uh, creates $2.2 billion in state and local taxes. That same airport business activity also contributes another $3.1 billion in annual federal tax dollars. So that results in a total tax contribution of $5.3 billion per year. And Sky Harbor is, as I'm sure you know, a busy place. So each day, 123,000 passengers arrive and depart at Sky Harbor Airport. To put that in perspective, that's similar to playing two Arizona Cardinals sold out games every day, 365 days out of the year. 1,200 planes land and take off every day. 2.1 million pounds of cargo is processed at the airport every day. And then another interesting fact, about 5,300 cars are rented by people flying into Arizona every day at the airport. And Sky Harbor is a very complicated facility that is physically constrained by surrounding roadways, railways, and waterways. You may recall that back in October of 2018, when discussing airport land use strategy with the Community and Economic Development uh, Department, we showed council how constrained our campus is. As shown here, we have about 3,400 acres to meet our current and future demand. Now that's slightly larger than the Las Vegas airport, but it's only about 40% of the size of the Tucson airport just down the road. It's about a third of the size of Houston Intercontinental Airport. It's only about 20% the size of Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport and it's only about 10% the size of Denver International Airport. So as stewards of this facility, it is incumbent upon us to try to identify a roadway or a pathway that will ensure Sky Harbor can continue to serve the future aviation needs for the city and the state of Arizona. And so today we're not seeking approval for a specific project, but instead we're seeking your approval for that roadmap to the future for Sky Harbor. So the count provides us with that roadmap. It shows how we can move from where we are today to where we anticipate we will need to be in the future. The roadmap we're proposing today focuses on development that is safe, adaptable, efficient, and demand driven. And lastly, the plan has been developed with robust stakeholder and community input that we will discuss in more detail. Now I would just uh, like to turn it over to Jordan Feld, our Deputy Aviation Director for Planning and Environmental to review the camp with you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett, Mayor and Council. Uh, let's start by talking about the, the planning process and the importance of the uh, stakeholder involvement in that process. We started camp by working with City Council to identify stakeholders to be part of this process. Together we identified over 150 different stakeholders to invite to serve on a project planning committee. And this, those stakeholders range between uh, airfield uh, operators, airport tenants, neighborhood associations, art interests, uh, community interests, regional economic interests, MAG, Maricopa Association of Governments. So a, a very robust stakeholder set was brought together and through that planning committee process, we asked this diverse stakeholder group, what do you like about the airport? What are your concerns about the airport? What, what are your priorities for the airport as it grows over 20 years? And particularly, if cargo, passengers, all the things that make the airport great continues to grow, what types of things should we be looking at in this planning process to make sure that we can accommodate and support all that demand and, and future growth? 
We did numerous community presentations outside of the formal stakeholder process. So we did uh, industry breakfast for Valley Partnership. We did a, a, a East Van Buren Business Association breakfast. Uh, so many different groups besides just the project committees were, were kept informed of the project as we moved forward over the last 18 months. No less than seven updates to the Phoenix Aviation Advisory Board uh, over that period. And frankly, they were instrumental not only in um, listening to staff and, and letting us talk about the issues the stakeholders were identifying, uh, but, but guiding that process and making sure with their, their knowledge uh, of the airport that we were uh, achieving their goals as well. Uh, this is actually our third stop in front of the City Council. We kicked off the camp process uh, in 2017 with the City Council. And as Mr. Bennett mentioned last fall, we came back with some of the initial land use recommendations coming out of the camp. And finally, we held two open house, just general public workshops where anyone could drop in and find out what was going on. We did one at the beginning of the project, one towards the end. All of the materials at those workshops were translated in Spanish. We had translators at those workshops. And uh, related to the project website, again, all of these materials were, were quickly put on the website, so anyone who wanted to access them and review them could. The materials were, again, translated uh, on the project website. Our PR division at the airport did a great job of pushing this information out on social media. In fact, a lot of our feedback, informal feedback, and, and ideas we got on camp came through Facebook and, and those types of comments that we got. So the stakeholders identified three key areas of concern that camp needed to address. And the first one is the ter terminal facility experience. Phoenix Sky Harbor has great terminal facilities today, but we're quickly reaching capacity on those facilities. And when you compare that to our forecasted growth, it's fairly clear we, we really need to get ahead of this because we're going to grow and grow and grow, and that obviously puts pressure on these facilities. All of the stakeholders talked about the diversity of business at the airport. And what I mean by that is the Air National Guard operations, the cargo operations, the aero biz, the Honeywells, the general aviation, all these things that contribute to the airport economy were critical and they wanted to make sure we were providing room for their growth and all of these different operators anticipate continued growth. And finally, all stakeholders identify the roadways at Sky Harbor as a real problem. Connectivity to the interstate system is a challenge. Finding your way once you get off the interstate around the airport is a challenge. The amount of traffic on the roadway is a challenge. And because of those stakeholder priorities, we specifically studied this. And what we found out was something like 40% of the traffic at rush hour on Sky Harbor Boulevard is cut through traffic. They're just trying to get from one end of the airport to the other. They're not there for an airport purpose. And stakeholders identified some, you know, fairly significant security concerns with having that same kind of open public roadway system going through your terminal core without dedicated security facilities to check that or inspect that traffic when we need to or do surprise inspections. So that they wanted to make sure camp addressed that issue. So what's causing some of the challenges that the stakeholders identified that likely from a trend perspective will only get worse and worse? Many of our facilities at the airport were planned and designed for a plane that looks like the one you're looking at right now. About 140 seats and about 50% of that plane's full of people, your purse, your bag, whatever is on an empty seat next to you. Uh, today, this is really the experience. A 180 seat plane, there aren't really empty seats. The, what, what us planners call load factor, the number of people on the plane is closer to 85, 90% today. So a lot more intensity going through the terminals, the roadways, the baggage claim that we need to be able to account for. And this trend of larger planes, more intense traffic on the, coming off the planes will, will continue. So as part of the planning pro process, we forecast out demand. We look at passenger demand, cargo demand, and how that relates to the demand on support facilities. So let's start with passenger demand. Our historical growth rate is around 2.5%, 3% compounded annually a year. And so that's essentially what you're seeing here. And you can see at that growth rate, we're at about 70 million passengers in 20 years. Similarly, the cargo is expected to grow tremendously, what we call the, the sixth C of Arizona's economy. We should double our cargo tonnage over the next 20 years, 800,000 tons. So 
that demand, passenger and cargo demand, as well as other forecast demand, influences how we think about the support facilities and the acreage of things needed, back of house operations, operations, security, ground prep, all the things needed to support that growth. We have 210 acres of that back of the house stuff today, and we're forecasted to need 390 acres over the 20 years, meaning that we have a 180 acre deficiency today relative to how we expect to operate 20 years from now. And I should note, please, uh, if you want me to stop it and spend more time on any of these issues, please, please. Uh. So I, I was allowed one wonky slide, um, <laughs> and this is it. <laughs> so key to the airport planning process is taking stakeholder priorities, looking at how things are expected to grow, and then comparing that information to benchmarking standards. So industry standards about how the baggage claim should function, how much linear feed of terminal curb you need for this many passengers. So we synthesize that information and we compare it to benchmark standards and we're able to come up with level of service grades or really another way, a less dorkier way of saying that is how would you rate the passenger experience? And so when we look out into the future, if we were to apply the forecasted demand to what we have today, meaning you know, with no expansion, no improvements, no upgrades, if we just continue to use the airport we have today with forecasted growth, our report card would have us at a D minus in five years, and in 10 years we'd be at F, and in 20 years we'd be at F minus. So this is really what drives the stakeholder interest and staff interest in making sure that we're thinking about how, how could we not let it get to that point because the, the biggest priority of the stakeholders were accept the growth but maintain the level of service. So how do we do that? Let's look at the existing layout of the airport real quick and then we'll talk about land use concepts that will get us there. So here you can see the airport layout, I-10 on the west, the light rail transit line on the north, Salt River on the south and the State Route 143 on the east. And somewhat going right through the, the middle of the airport property there, the Union Pacific Railroad line. Here is the existing cargo operations. You can see it's a split operation, about 25 acres lo located in the terminal core area and another 30 to 40 acres located on the south side of the airfield. First, that does create some inefficiencies for the cargo operators. But if you're trying to accommodate the forecasted passenger growth, having cargo operations, other types of operations in your terminal core area is really inefficient. You, you, you wanna get that out of there so you can make room for terminal growth and see if you can find the room for cargo and other uses not in the terminal. Complicating what I just said is the amount of back of the house stuff that's also in the terminal core area. So, overnight ramps, special event ramps, maintenance facilities, operations and security. All of these things are critical to the airport success, but do not need to be in the terminal core area. Here you're seeing where our aerobiz, general aviation activities are occurring. So this is GA maintenance on aircraft, Honeywell avionics testing. It's a major chunk of, of the uh, airport economy, the general aviation aerobiz uses at the airport. Here you're seeing where the Air National Guard facility is today. And finally, the terminal facilities as they exist today, and we're showing both the terminal footprint itself here, but also critical, the cross-field taxiways that allow the airlines to operate the split airfield operation that we have at Sky Harbor. So. Now, the, the good news, the recommendations. How, how, how do we, how do we uh, accommodate this forecasted growth? Well, first, let's get the aero support stuff out of the terminal core, and we think we can achieve that by using our land holdings north of the airport, east of Honeywell, uh, and we'll talk about how trenching the railroad is really critical to that concept. The next thing we looked at was, well, wh what can we do with cargo to make that operation more efficient? Similarly, we can use our land holdings north of the airport west of Honeywell to create a new cargo complex that not only solves some of the existing cargo issues we have, but will accommodate the forecasted 800,000 tons of cargo we expect over the 20 years. 
So the effect of that, moving the support and cargo to the north side, means we can leverage the terminal core for what it was always intended for, terminal uses, continued passenger growth. And you can see on the south side of the field, playing this kind of musical chairs, we're able to free up the current cargo ramp and those cargo buildings, which are sized well for Air National Guard needs. We're able to make that land available for the Air National Guard that expects over the next five years or so to completely replace their refueling fleet with new aircraft. That's what's necessitating their additional land needs. And finally, stakeholders felt this was a very critical issue in camp because as camp begins to build to the north, it begins to interface with existing city policies, reinvent Phoenix, transit-oriented development, design guidelines, and kind of the expectation for how the light rail corridor along Washington will develop. So two things came out of the process identified by stakeholders in the outreach. Uh, one being the area from 24th Street to 26th Street is a, is a small business zone and the community said, you know, if you can kind of leave that area for a while, maybe use airport land to help activate some of the other parcels or, or help that area continue to revitalize, we would like to see that. And so we've put that into the planning process. You can see here we're reserving that, that area between 24th and 26th Street south of Washington. And the other kind of key transition to the light rail corridor issue is making sure that development that does go up north really does have TOD design guidelines and incorporates those principles as it faces Washington. As you see it from the street from Washington, it should look like TOD development. So this is a rendering, a bird's eye view, looking from Terminal 3, the blue polygon there at the bottom of the map, looking west. And so you can see, and we'll kind of walk through the, the different facilities shown here, but just so we have our bearing straight again, we're, we're, it's like we're hovering above Terminal 3, looking to the west. First, you can see the project we're working on right now, extension of the SkyTrain to the rental car center. So the first phase of the West Terminal, actually you can see here, looks like an extension of Terminal 3 South. And the idea is we're able to incrementally add gates here by using the Terminal 3 facilities already in place. So it's a cost effective way of starting to grow our capacity. Eventually though, we would build out the entire South Side of that West terminal, you're seeing that here, and install a new main building for security processing and baggage and, and all the other things you would, you're used to seeing in a terminal building. Very quickly, we'll need a West Crossfield taxiway to support the terminal activities we would now be uh, developing in this area. Critical to all of this, as the stakeholders said, we really need to get better with the roadway system. So what you're seeing here is a security plaza located close to 24th Street, so all traffic coming in to the airport could theoretically be stopped and screened. Uh, this really solves the cut through issues in a lot of ways because you're gonna be much less likely to wanna cut through the airport if you think there's a security plaza you're gonna have to contend with. And then more directly, it really does help with our security issues. You can also see a much more intuitive roadway alignment, much more straighter roadway alignment here. We will need to build two Crossville taxiways at some point as we begin to really fill up that West Terminal area. Uh, the airfield traffic will demand that second Crossville taxiway. And finally, towards the end of the planning horizon, we would expect to build out the West Terminal, and here you're seeing the north side of the West Terminal. And importantly, again, the north side of the West Terminal is connecting back into Terminal 3 meaning that passengers could walk post-security between the terminals, connect to a plane that isn't in the terminal they're in right now without having to leave the security area and come back through. So it's a major benefit to the, the passenger experience. This is another bird's eye view rendering. Here we're kind of hovering above 24th Street, looking to the east. And so at the as we kind of mentioned, the, the key thing with using our land to the north is going to be working with the Union Pacific Railroad to, to trench the railroad in certain places. And so you can see the trenching here, indicated by the red line. Besides the airport benefits, we did want to call out the surface street benefits of grade separating 
the railroad from 24th Street where today the train will occasionally stop uh, on 24th Street uh, and I've personally experienced this, so we'll back up traffic for 45 minutes. And here you're seeing a depiction of the taxiway bridges that would go over to the trench and enable the cargo use of this 80-acre cargo complex along Washington. So to try and show a, a, qu a quick rendering, if you will, of how TOD principles would be integrated with cargo development, uh, we did this street view rendering, which you can see here. It would not look like the view from I-10 as you're looking at the cargo complex today. It would look like transit-oriented development from the street. It would include a mix of uses. So we would be able to achieve airport job creation, the cargo needs of the airport, but also bring in all of the kind of existing policies towards this area. This is a bird's eye view of the cargo, excuse me, the facilities complex east of Honeywell. So here we're essentially hovering over Washington, looking to the south. And you can see, again, the trenched railroad. And that sets up our ability to then have a secured roadway bridge over the trench, which means that all of the back of the house operations that are scattered throughout the airport today would have one single secured area that they could do the flight prep, kitchen prep, do all those things, and then enter the airport without having to get back on local streets and get into the terminal core. Eventually, we would actually want to improve that setup by installing a tunnel that would take you from this facilities complex under the north runway so that that traffic had a shorter drive, but also minimized airfield vehicles, which is a good safety goal. So you're seeing on this rendering the community college at the kind of bottom right of the screen there, as well as the 38th Street light rail station. So here again, it's really important to integrate TOD design principles. And so we're showing this TOD setback, if you will, where there would be particular emphasis on mixed use, walkability, landscaping, the types of things we think about when we're talking about transit-oriented development. Again, this is another just quick kind of street view rendering of what we just talked about. Again, you can see enhanced landscaping, bringing the buildings closer to the street, trying to create a more walkable environment along Washington. And we'll hand it back to Mr. Bennett. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, the camp uh, provides us with that roadmap uh, that we can use to manage our uh, airport assets into the future. Uh, so let's just spend a quick uh, minute or two reviewing some of the major projects and some of the phasing and the cost associated with them. In the near term, we would envision uh, about a billion dollars worth of additional capital investments uh, at Sky Harbor in the zero to five year period. Some items uh, that would be included in that would be working on the railroad trench and also uh, getting the north property uh, prepared for development and acquiring additional parcels on the north side of the airport. And uh, as each of these projects, as I go through these, as each of these projects become ready for investment, we would be coming back to city council for uh, review and your approval of each of these individual projects moving forward. So in the five to, year, five to 10 year time frame. We would look at uh, continued airfield improvements. Uh, we would be maturing that north cargo complex a little bit further. And also the, that initial concourse that Jordan referenced on that uh, new west terminal, as well as uh, some of those roadway improvements uh, in the core. Then even looking further out in the 10 to 20 time period, and you know this is a, starts to get a little a guessing involved here at the 10 to 20, so we would be constantly uh, reviewing this program. But in that longer term, we anticipate another $1.7 billion worth of investments necessary. And uh, you can see some of the items that would be included in that, uh, building out that terminal processor in that west terminal complex, as well as further expansion of the cargo facility and uh, some general aviation uh, expansion opportunities at the airport. And then lastly, in the uh, really long term, 20 plus year, time frame, there could be an investment of another $1.8 billion, and that would be the north side of that west uh, con, uh, con, uh, terminal building, 
and also that tunnel under the north runway and uh, also an opportunity we think to uh, perhaps redevelop our international facilities as international traffic has grown and the demands on that have changed. So overall, uh, this uh, roadmap is estimated, uh, the facility investment to be about 5.7 billion and with all uh, airport investments that we make, it would be paid for by a combination of state and federal grants, our passenger facility charges that uh, the airport's been levying for many, many years, our general airport revenue bonds, and also private investment. Uh, and as, uh, uh, as we go through this and, and trying to prepare for the future, uh, Denise Olson, the city's CFO, will be bringing forth to the council for your consideration, I believe at the June 19th meeting, a, uh, an authorizing bond ordinance that would uh, uh, enable us to then get prepared for starting some of these near-term investment needs as we move forward. So uh, our recommendation, Mayor and uh, members of the council, would be that uh, we request your approval of the Comprehensive Asset Management Plan, and we would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. And once again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. We have many distinguished guests here with us today to uh, participate in this process and provide testimony. So if it works for my colleagues, I will start with cards. Uh, we'll begin with uh, David Anderson. Followed by Christina Floor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm David Anderson, Director of Airport Affairs and Properties for American Airlines in Fort Worth, Texas. As you consider taking action on camp, I would like to share with you Americans' thoughts regarding the process and the components that are in camp. Jim Bennett and his aviation department team implemented a very collaborative process with numerous opportunities for the airlines and other stakeholders to provide meaningful input and comments over the past year. The opportunities included public group meetings along with individual stakeholder meetings. The camp section within skyharbor.com provided up-to-date drafts of camp along with timelines and other pertinent information. Additionally, American Fields, the Aviation Department team, gave thoughtful consideration to Americans' feedback and were very appreciative. An underlying theme of CAMP is that it outlines development options which are incremental and cost-effective. These potential projects can be phased to match actual growth patterns at the airport. This results in cost-effective development and continued competitive rates and charges compared to other large hub airports. Because of this approach to the development roadmap, American is very supportive of the proposed camp. American Airlines thanks you for this opportunity to share the comments. Thank you. We're hopeful if we do it, then you'll bring us a nonstop flight to Asia. I can, I can dream. Uh, Christina will be followed by Nicholas Cortez. Hello, Mayor. Gallego and members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Christina Floor. Um, I've come to you before as landscape architect. In this case, I'm coming to you as a citizen, and I'm in full support of the whole plan. I think it, you know we're very fortunate to have an airport that is so convenient to so many parts of the valley, but there are some challenges with all the things that have been mentioned so far, and I think you know looking forward to the next 20 years in addressing those is gonna be fantastic. Um, I actually am the daughter of one of the original pilots at the Air National Guard, and I had the benefit of going to the Guard from the 1960s in, up until today. I make a, a yearly visit uh, in March, and um, I have to say that in the old days of the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of space. The Guard was very much a, low, a lower key entity than it is today. But with the way things have changed across the world, of course, the Guard has also responded to that and grown and expanded over the last few years. But as a visitor to the Guard, it feels like the campus is too tight for the services that they need to provide for our country and our state. And I think the expansion for the Guard by moving the cargo and consolidating that together is going to be a benefit for both of those entities. And uh, I think that if, in that regard, I'd like to provide support for that from that standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas Cortez. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. 
Thank you, and thank you for your work with, uh, on behalf of neighborhoods surrounding Sky Harbor. Uh, for those of you listening online, uh, Mr. Cortez appreciates the opportunity to speak and, and chooses to be neutral. Uh, Gonzalo de la Malena. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Gonzalo de la Malena. I served the community for the last 10 years as the president for the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the operator of the Minority Business Council. And um, it is certainly a benefit and a challenge of having a great urban airport that's close in versus some of the other airports that Director Bennett mentioned that have a much bigger envelope. And so I applaud uh, airport management and team and staff to develop a comprehensive plan. And I want to provide just a couple of additional comments in favor of CAMP. So in addition to being the largest economic generator for our state, I want to talk about the multiplier effect that's been created um, by our airport. And seven years ago, you all made a very conscious effort to include more women, small, local, and minority-owned firms in the supply chains to grow our airport, to build it out, to be inclusive, and a, a reflection of our community, not only in the food and beverage program, the retail program, the supply chain program. And that has a tremendous uh, impact on our local economy. And so on behalf of the dozens upon dozens of uh, women, small and local minority-owned firms that participate in, in the programs uh, at the airport, um, I'd like to say uh, thank you for that ongoing support. This roadmap is a uh, responsible strategy. You know, all signs are pointing up, increased cargo, terminal, gates, flow, uh, and all the pressure that's happening. Um, I'm, in particular, I'm excited about the activity on the west side of the airport, so now our colleagues and a lot of the consumers and travelers coming in from the west side of the airport will be able to uh, enjoy a lot of the transportation uh, that will be supported there. So I wanted to say um, thank you for your support. Uh, definitely um, encourage this comprehensive plan of the camp and uh, look forward to, to continuing to work together. Thank you. Thank you. We have eight cards of, uh, in favor of the camp plan representing stakeholders including the Phoenix Aviation Board, the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, and the National Guard. Um, many of those individuals are available to speak if necessary. Is there anyone who would like to provide comments? All right, with that, then I will turn it over to council members for comments or questions. Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I want to thank the Air National Guard for everything that they do, uh, the fact that you protect us so heavily in this country. Uh, I don't think people realize what this is going to do, what this vote today is going to do, is to expand the use of the Air National Guard. Uh, they're going to be able to bring in new planes. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get the new uh, refueling jets uh, with this vote today, is that correct? We'd be able to at least apply for it and get it in time to the federal government. Is that, I'm just wondering if that's right. Fantastic. I, I don't think people realize what this, the Air National Guard does and the fact that they are our neighbors. Um, they live down the street from us. They live across the street from us. They live in our city. They live around in our, in our state. And it was designed that way. The Air National Guard was meant to have that connection to the public. But at the same time, the refueling jets that the Air National Guard is going to be able to expand on is something critical to not only the city, not only the state, but this country. They are able to refuel jets, uh, you know, fighter jets from across the country. And right now, I believe you have six jets, and you're going to be able to expand close to 12 or something like that. Something like that. Eight to 12. That's huge. And so, uh, for those of you, if you need anything else, if you need anything in writing from us, I'm hoping that the federal government now looks at this and says there's a strong commitment here at the city of Phoenix to expand the Air National Guard and the services that they provide, and I'm excited about this. Uh, I've been waiting for this vote for a long time. Uh, a couple things. One, uh, one of the things that you mentioned when you looked up there, you looked at Houston, you looked at um, Las Vegas, a lot of those are, and Dallas, those are regional airports. 
this is a, an area, other than McCarran, I think McCarran's uh, in the city of Las Vegas, but a regional airport is nice, it sounds good, but the city of Phoenix has something even beyond that. They have something even more special. You can fly into the city and be pretty much anywhere in the city of Phoenix within eight to 10, 15 minutes, depending on traffic and when you get in. And that is highly unusual. And the asset that we have here, the billions of dollars that are brought in, I've never bought into all those economic studies, but at the end of the day, all you have to do is look at it and look at what it provides. Um, and so credit to you for you know, being able to work together and work together as a community and work for our city and put together a plan that I think is exemplary. I've got some questions on that. Uh, you're gonna be moving general aviation looks to the north side. Does that mean you're moving Swift and Cutter too, or is it just other types of general aviation? And are you gonna be having basically uh, places for them to be able to store their airplanes on that area or not? I don't know. Uh, Mayor to Councilman DeCicio, thank you for the uh, question. The, uh, the initial intent is not to relocate what you refer to as the Cutter and Swift campus. They, they could still remain where they are. But we currently have some general aviation activity on the north side uh, today. Uh, and when we use that term general aviation, we're talking about uh, like the state of Arizona have their aircraft there, Salt River right. Project, a lot of the very important companies and businesses uh, in the Phoenix metropolitan area store their aircraft there. Those spaces are at capacity, so we would have to relocate some of them in the north area. Okay, and then you, uh, the, the moving and consolidating of cargo, I think, is great. Uh, is there, I'm, and I'm just asking because I'm a novice at this, you know, too, I'm just curious, because of the weight of cargo and the weight of some of those jets, is that one of the reasons that you've got them on the longer field, that you have their airline? Is that why that's there? Just out of curiosity. Uh, Mayor, Councilman, appreciate the question. Um, the, the cargo operation uses the, the full range of, of jets, so you'll see very small cargo aircraft right. as well as the largest uh, cargo aircraft. British Airways flies them, too. So, uh, it does because the most critical aircraft is obviously the largest one it really does benefit the cargo operation to have the closer proximity to the north runway the longest runway so I, I think that's where you're going with that and then the, the fact that we're going to be realigning I believe the Union Pacific line to go there is because it's going to make it a lot easier for people to dump off their cargo into a rail and vice versa they'll be able to get it on a jet is that the thought process behind that Mayor Councilman, thank you again. Uh, there certainly is this kind of intermodal goal behind all of this. The specifics of it at this conceptual level are, aren't detailed, but yeah, that, that, that synergy you get from the intermodal connection is critical. And so my wife does a lot of flying. I mean, I stay home. She jets around everywhere, works everywhere. That's what she does. I stay in Phoenix, take care of the kids. That's just our roles. But um, she, um, and she's able to see the airports in all around the country, and I've, and I've seen them internationally. And I've got to tell you, our airport is amazing. It's so clean. The cleanliness of it is a big thing for a lot of people. The fact now that we have multiple types of operators that are in there, a lot of them are, a lot if not most, are Arizona-born types of businesses. I think that's a story that we need to tell, Ed, is just the fact of how many Arizona businesses operate out of the airport. And when we did that, you know, you could tell that a lot of the national ones were like a little weary of us and telling us how they were all gonna fail, but look how successful they've been. And they're almost all, almost all, if not all, small business owners in the city of Phoenix. So, I mean, when we made that move, uh, we were able now to provide a different type of service to the public, but at the same time, provide local small business owners. And I thought it was a great move, I, and I, you know, I'm always critical of costs and things like that and finances, as you know. But at the same time, I'm very aware of how effective you guys have been. You've been amazing. Uh, the work that you've done there, the fact that you are an economic driver in the city, and the way you've kept up that airport on a continual basis. I mean, you, you go into uh, our bathrooms, just as simple thing as that, and look and compare them to other places around the country and around the world, and they're just spotless at all times. So that's a, a lot of credit for you and, and the people that you've put there. And, and the fact is that you gotta look at the people that are in the private sector too, those individual workers that are there, 
those individual workers have done an amazing job. You can tell the level of pride they take. So, you know, the way we've structured this, the way we worked it in the past, even though there's been some rough goings, I've got to tell you, from the, the workers that, that work hard that you never see, the silent faces, all the way up to the top management, uh, you've done a really good job of bringing in the right people there, and I would keep it up. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious the type of interaction you had with Gateway Community College. Obviously, they're north of the airport, and they're probably a very important part of your study. So I was looking at the slides, slide 21, where you show some of the land uses, and they all seem to relate to, to airlines. Was there any thought to try to integrate and help support the community college? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman, thank you so much for that question. Uh, the um, Dr. Gubser from May, May, or excuse me, the Maricopa Community College was, was part of the stakeholder process. Uh, all of the stakeholders talked a lot about what, what you just said, which was um, it looks like you've got the room to provide a lot of the airline office, back of the house things. So to make it all work over time, it only helps the airport to integrate the, the non aero uses as well into that area to create true mixed use. And that is really a, a goal of camp. We didn't get into it in a lot of detail today, but you're, you're exactly on point. So just as a follow up, will you be doing some additional planning with the community college looking at the, the land uses to the south of the light rail? Because I think they're, they could really feed off of each other. I think that's important. And as you know, Jordan, I'm a planner. You're smiling because you're a planner too. Um, I too want to thank you all for what you've done. And, and the, the airport really is something to brag about. We really are lucky. Um, actually, it's kind of fun going to the airport just to have a good lunch or dinner <laughs> with all the restaurants we have there. But I would agree with uh, the councilman. We, we are blessed to have such a great airport that's clean, that when people come, they feel welcome to this um, community. So thank you. I think this is a great plan. It's a great start, but we may want to continue to look at the long range planning as we move forward. Thank you, thank you, Councilwoman, great points. It is nice to have a planner on the council to work with our planners at the airport. And we really appreciate the time and commitment you put into this process going out to the community and, and meeting with different stakeholders. Our airport is going to hit capacity and we have to keep making these investments to move forward. It's important that our neighbors know what we are doing. We, are, this, we don't want to Un, uh, undersell that this will have an impact on the folks around the airport and it's good that they understand why we are doing it. I think we can take a lot of the lessons we learn from investments such as the light rail to try to minimize the impacts of construction. So we've done a lot with looking ahead with locating utilities, doing as much planning as we can in advance, uh, working on traffic coordination and, and the timing of the construction. And that will be useful to us as we work with Union Pacific Union Pacific was there before the city of Phoenix and has very strong rights to the property and so we appreciate them being willing to work with us and we ought to look very closely on the, the time frames and understanding what the impacts will be in the area so we can try to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, the airport is, is the big player and the economic engine in the area and we want to make it work for as many people. Uh, I'm grateful that you made the commitment to transit oriented development as well. The north side may be the back of the airport from a pilot's perspective, but for many people in the city, it is the front, and we want people as they journey through Washington and other key streets to see active uses as much as possible. So I wanna echo Councilwoman Stark's statements that while, while we are planning this process, the more we can do with active uses, the better. Um, we've had some great folks in our community who've come up with plans and opportunities for short-term uses for properties, like the Greyhound facility. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to interim uses and for the time when we are not actively in doing construction, particularly on the key corridor along Washington. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, so from, you know, from a timing standpoint, the land prep, the trenching, th that will take you know, a, a good two, three years uh, to do all of that. And then the focus re will really be setting up the facilities for the cargo relocation, for the facilities re relocation, which is to say that entire 
200 foot setback or more from Washington won't necessarily be in play for any kind of airport need in the immediate. So it's more about what types of land uses can we start to put in there that we know will integrate well with the cargo facilities, the rest of the things as they start to catch up to Washington. So I think Councilwoman Stark, you're hitting it on the head here. There's some implementation planning we now need to do that's you know more micro level to this corridor. Uh, as the Councilwoman once told me, planning begets planning. Uh, so, so that will be kind of the next steps here as we implement. And of course, the environmental assessment that we will need to do this will address a lot of those other issues you were just speaking of. Uh, you know, how do we mitigate any uh, environmental or externalities that might come out of this and make sure we're integrating that into the planning process as well. Wonderful. And uh, we spent last year some time talking about how our departments could work together. So I don't know if this may be a question for our assistant city manager, but can you speak how community and economic development is involved? Yes, uh, Mayor, members of the council, we came before you in the fall to talk about the land use and the areas of opportunity around the airport. We spoke specifically about uh, areas of land that we could coordinate and collaborate with community and economic development. So Chris Mackey and her team is already working with the airport on opportunities that you all have spoke about where we can go into some longer term leases if we know the land isn't going to be available in the near future and or if there's properties that we know are not going to be used by the airport that community and economic development can work with. Wonderful, because there are some exciting pieces of property and we can activate them before the airport needs them. Yes. That's a win for people visiting our city. Councilman Nowakowski. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, where it says cargo and that um, aero support, do we own all that property at the present moment or? Uh, Mayor, Councilman, thank you. Uh, the airport owns about 150 acres between 24th Street and 44th Street. Uh, north of the railroad, uh, so we have most of it, but no, th there's uh, approximately another 100 acres or so total that we would need to acquire to complete all of it and, and reach the 20 year view. We obviously don't need all that property right away though, so that, that there lies kind of th this interim planning scenario uh, that we've been talking about. And just a couple of years ago, we went through a whole thing with South Phoenix with the light rail and some of the businesses and the stakeholders that own the property actually knew what was going on, but the individuals leasing the properties didn't know what was going on. Um, as a child, um, I remember going to the um, park and swap and, and spending a lot of time out there and on Wednesday nights and stuff like that. I was just wondering if there's a way for us to actually take a, a map or even have a little demonstration of what might be happening in the near future so a lot of those um, individuals that have little 10 by 10 booths out there that are little incubators for future businesses out there in our community, that they understand that this is gonna happen in the near future. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, but it might happen so that they don't really bank on staying there for a long period of time. And I think if we can also look at some of the um, surrounding maybe even churches or community um, centers that are out there. I know that we've been hitting up most of all the schools and with signs and, and flyers, but also um, maybe some of those um, institutions that have been there for a long time that we can maybe make sure that everybody knows that this is coming down the road. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia. Mayor, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's also adding that they can take part in what's coming to the future. I think there's entire neighborhoods that had been previously displaced by airport growth. And so I think it's important that we also honor those legacies and the folks that live there. And so I, I'd like to look at, into that in the future as we're moving forward. Um, and also what, uh, yeah, just including folks in the, in the practice of making sure that these properties are not just, you know, making lots with rocks on them. And we may want an update on the great work we did on the west side of the airport um, last year where we talked about honoring some of the history of the area, investment in key infrastructure, including streets and water and uh, the veterans heritage project as well as cultural trail. So there's lots of great things happening around the airport, all of which we will not be able to cover today. So thank you for that. 
I also wanted to, uh, uh, Councilman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I, I really want to thank you for all the work you've put in on this. Uh, it's just not the hours in the office, it's the hours out of the office, the community meetings, uh, the board meetings, uh, meeting with investors, rail lines, airplane owners, uh, airlines. Uh, it, it's been a phenomenal process and I really congratulate you. I know that an airport, especially of this quality, if it doesn't continue to grow, it will die. And the impact it would have on Arizona and Phoenix would be tremendous. It would be disastrous. And I believe that your plan really looks out not only for Phoenix, uh, the airlines, but for Arizona and for the Air Guard, because I think that's also extremely important. I agree with Councilman DeCicio on its importance and that you are paying special attention and putting them where they continue to grow uh, as they have new planes, different sizes, et cetera, et cetera. They are invaluable and we need them there. Uh, I am very pleased that you have taken this long range. I think what's exceptional is when you talk about the cost of doing all this, it's very economical. I, I was really surprised how low it was when you consider what you bring to this state every year and what you were saying it's gonna cost over 20 years. Um, I was very, very impressed. So thank you, um, knowing full well that we will probably have some additional overruns uh, as time goes by and prices go up. No, I know, Jim, you wouldn't think of that. But, <laughs> but you really, really went out of your way to do a good job and include the community. And I think that's what it was all about for months is everybody had a place at the table and will continue to have a voice in this process. Uh, we are depending on you for the success of this now and 20 years and 40 years from now. Uh, we are very, very pleased that uh, you have the, the best in mind and quality is always utmost in your mind and thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. Councilwoman. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. I really um, look forward to this plan, but I also want to echo what Council, and I'm not going to repeat everything, what Council Member Garcia and what Council Member Nowakowski are also talking about. But being out also in my, in my, in my district and on all the doors that I knocked on and everyone that I talked to, you know, making sure that we have good, you know, that we have good jobs in the city of Phoenix is very important. And I understand how key the airport has been, has been to creating those jobs. I am very proud and to see that the airport is an economic engine, right? Like being a representative at the airport, I've seen it firsthand and how great it's been for people that actually work there and the pride that they actually take with every coffee that they make, with every person that they serve as they come into Sky Harbor and how pleasant the workers actually make it. And I want to be part of a team to try to figure out how do we address some of the concerns that, you know, we've talked about today, but then at the same time, how do we keep creating those great quality jobs so that we make sure that everyone comes into, comes into the airport, wants to come back. I, I think that's very important and the workers there definitely make that happen. Thank you, great comments. Any final comments or uh, Vice Mayor, any comments before we entertain a motion? I have a comment. Please. No, I'm good, Mayor. Thank you very much though. I appreciate you asking. I think it's all been covered. <laughs> Councilman Pastor. <laughs> Sounded like Mickey. No, just joking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's the Mickey ears. I'm teasing him because he went to Disneyland. That's why. Um, one of the questions, because uh, Councilwoman Stark brought up a good point regarding Gateway and, uh, a, and uh, about jobs in the sense of, are we looking at Gateway as we built out and working with Gateway on what the future jobs are gonna look like in that area and being able to build the skilled worker that we need in order to, to uh, move into those jobs. Um, I would like to uh, 
at least start that dialogue because the community college moves uh, a little slower. Uh, so they have to, as planners, they, have, they usually plan two years in advance, so we probably should get moving in the sense of having the dialogue. Mayor, Councilwoman, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, the camp process, we worked with the community college at, at a very high level as we talked about. We'll now go into some more detailed planning. But uh, I can tell you from personal experience, community colleges that offer airframe mechanic certifications and, and just degrees towards the aero industry are, are some of the most sought after students there are. And by bringing the airport closer to Gateway's doorstep, the more we're gonna be facilitating that additional bucket for Gateway Community College to develop and, and leverage from the airport expansion. Okay, because um, I know you're probably talking to uh, MCCD. I think where you need to move down to is to Gateway um, and to the president and to the cabinet because uh, that is really where all the work happens and that's really where the relationship is. Uh, and that can help, uh, the district can help in m many different other ways of financial or partnering with workforce development and pieces like that. Uh, but to really start looking at where the certificates are going and what, what is it gonna take to create those certificates in a, time, a timely fashion, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's a great suggestion, thank you, Councilman. Um, the other piece, was uh, talking about, I, I know that we do community um, outreach around that area, but I also feel like a lot of the working families live in other districts and, uh, and really have an impact on the airport because that's where they go to their jobs. And I think it's be wise on our part that we talk to those uh, employees from those working families as to really what the needs are um, in a holistic way. Uh, transportation is, is key to these working families coming from the west side all the way uh, to, I guess, the east side. Uh, and what does that take and what does that look like in a multimodal fashion? Uh, and how do they get to the airport? Because I can guarantee you they probably take a bus and light rail. And so I think that's very important and a key part to uh, understand uh, the needs of our employees and how they get to the airport. I really appreciate uh, city leadership and staff and really appreciate our community partners in, in working on the comprehensive plan because it's been a while and we're finally here and finally able to see all the fruits of everybody's labor and able to pass a plan uh, for the next 20 years. I'm assuming there will be adjustments in the next 20 years only because I, I believe with technology and everything else we will be modernizing and I don't know what airplanes will look like. So, uh, but thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. Mayor, I've been on the council for 11 years and one of the things that we're very proud of is the um, airport and it's the diversity of the businesses that we have within the airport and that's one of the things that we fought for last for the last 10 years is that making sure that we have minority owned businesses that we have women owned businesses and most important local and if you walk through our airport one of the comments that I always hear is that what great restaurants we have here there are local restaurants that you can't find in any other airport throughout the country and I think that's what makes us unique is including the local businesses and the minority businesses and coming up with a plan where those businesses aren't just a part of the airport, but they're a part of our community also by giving back and helping out those nonprofits and those organizations that touch everyone in the city of Phoenix. So I wanna make sure that we're gonna approve this plan that we really reach out and we keep that spirit alive that makes us different from all the other airports, and we continue to work with those small businesses, those minority businesses, and also making sure that those businesses give back to our community to make it great like it is now. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
That's a great comment. And then as we develop economic impact numbers that include small businesses, I think we would love to be able to tell that story effectively. Wonderful. So I think we are ready for a motion. Mayor, I am so pleased with this plan, and I thank you all for participating, and I thank the council for working on this for almost a year. Uh, the camp proposal, I think, is excellent, outstanding, and I would recommend the council approve it. I'll second, second that. Oh. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you so much. With okay, Councilman Waring. <laughs> yes, I I got him. All right. Yes. <laughs> hey, yay, Waring. All right. Yes. Yeah. It's a historic. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. With that historic 9-0, we will adjourn. <laughs>